Well, I forgot to say to everybody, um, happy Labor Day. Yeah, no, it's tomorrow, but, you know, frankly, who among us has only celebrated on Monday? I mean, Labor Day weekend, you start about Wednesday before, don't you? <laughs> I, I know that, you know, in my growing up, whenever I, I hear of Labor Day, I, I brings to mind several things. I think of, of parades and picnics and family gatherings and... And um, I, I think of that kind of that last hurrah of summer. And uh, I know that school's already begun in this county, but when I was growing up, it always began the day after Labor Day. So there was a bit of dread in hearing the word Labor Day as well. Well, we know that uh, the reality, though, is that Labor Day came about, and uh, do you know when it was first begun? I don't either. I wasn't there. <laughs> but I looked it up. I Googled it. I love that word, Google. <laughs> you can Google just about anything. <clears throat> it's fun. I Googled it, and it said that it became a national holiday in 1894. Even though it was in the 1880s that it was begun by some workers, a carpenter and some others in, in, the, in the labor movement, uh, but as a national holiday, as early as 1894, the, the, uh, the government established it as a federal holiday. We know that it was, uh, that it was uh, you know, that it was established to celebrate and recognize the, the wonderful place of, of workers within the fabric of our society and how important it is that we depend upon each other. We know that uh, that... We all have different skills and abilities, talents, and that, uh, uh, that we are so interdependent one upon another, aren't we? We really are. I, I for instance, am very grateful for those in, in the medical field because I faint in blood. I, I just, I know I would be, you do not want me patching you up. <laughs> And even worse, you don't want me working on your car. I am very grateful for mechanics. And for those who have mechanical ability, I have none. You know, God maybe gave me a gift or two, but that's not among them. I, I'm grateful for engineers and mathematicians, people who can work with that side of their brain. I don't even have that side of my brain. It's just, it's just not part of of my gift set. But I'm grateful for those of you who have that gift, those gifts. We all work together, and without each other, where would our society be? Where would we be? I'm very grateful for sanitation workers. Now, it brought home uh, uh, to us in a very real way just a, a week or so ago, my daughter and her husband and, and three little grandchildren just moved into Palm Bay. And in the process of their moving here, uh, we, of course, contacted the sanitation department, told them to pick up the trash and all. Well, for some reason, for two weeks, they missed the trash pickup. They have two children in diapers. It was not a good thing <laughs> that the trash pickup we missed. <laughs> But it makes us appreciate, doesn't it? All of those services that we get and all of the ways in which we depend upon one another. We as Christian people, we truly believe that those gifts are given to us by God. That our Heavenly Father has endowed us with gifts and talents and abilities that are kind of built into each of us. And they're all different. The Apostle Paul, uh, you know, talks about that, doesn't he, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, in, uh, 12, chapter 12, about the body and how he's talking about spiritual gifts, but it's also true of our native gifts, of our talents and abilities, not just spiritual gifts. That we all have different functions and different abilities, and it works together to make one body 
that's how we can look and see our society as well. We believe that those gifts are from God. He gives the raw material. Now, he also expects us to do something with them. And that's an important thing. We'll talk a little about that in a, just a minute, a little bit more. We know that, um, that work and labor is an important subject in the Bible. If you get on a, a, a if you have a, a program in a computer, a Bible program in your computer, and you have a search engine for that Bible program, and you input the words work, labor, uh, you're going to find that there are nearly, depending upon the version of the Bible you use, there are nearly a thousand verses that are related in some way to work and to labor. Nearly a thousand verses. That's a lot, folks. Scripture has a lot to say about that. And how important that is. <clears throat> We know that um, some of them are positive. Uh, I think of uh, Psalm 90, for instance. It says in Psalm 90 that God has established the work of our hands. That in other words, He's given us the gifts that we have, the native ability and the talents. He's given us those gifts. Some of the scripture references are negative, where where it says, "Don't use." Don't use your, uh, your gifts and abilities to work for evil. And it goes on kind of that side. And some say, don't misuse it or underuse it. And in those scriptures, it talks about idleness, about being idle, about not using those gifts. And that's where we come into this week's scripture. You, uh, by the way, I just... Uh, uh, you know, I know that you you know that uh, you already teased me already, and poor Dan, he has to put up with it because he's the handsome twin. <laughs> but I just want you to know. Well, he is. Don't laugh at that. He is. He's, he's the handsome twin. I uh, uh, I uh, I buzzed my hair real close so y'all could tell the difference. <laughs> just want you to know. Sorry, man. <laughs> For those who are just visiting, from the beginning, Dan and I have gotten teased at being lookalikes. So that will be forever his curse and my blessing. <laughs> this week you read Second Thessalonians. That was your uh, scripture reading for the week. And... Um, it was a, how fortuitous is it? You know, God just plans it all. He's sovereign over it all. That it would end with this whole idea of working in that passage. It's a negative reference to it, but it goes back to, uh, to the very beginning of when Paul helped establish with Silas this church in Thessalonica. And uh, so we want to kind of focus on that right now. Uh, they established that church in their second missionary journey. And you can find that in Acts 17. You can read about that second missionary journey where, where they went there. One of the main themes of Paul's teaching, and, and in 1 Thessalonians, we think, is about the earliest scripture in the New Testament. <coughs> that it, it precedes all the Gospels and everything else. It is believed to be maybe the first writing of the, of the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's old. It's old. It's older than me. It's old. And in that first, this first early writing, Paul was, was uh, just boiling over with enthusiasm with the good news that Jesus was going to return. That he was going to come back. And that he was going to establish God's kingdom once for all on the earth. And, and, and so he was preaching that, and, and they believed early on that it was going to happen any moment. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. But any moment, we should be ready. So he preached that with fervor. Now he noticed, evidently, we have hints that he noticed in Thess Thessalonia, in Thessalon Thessalonica. That's a wonderful word. Comes trickingly off the tongue. <laughs> Thessalonica. That's in northern Greece. Uh, 
a, a, an area, a region that's called Macedonia. In that northern region, uh, when he went there, evidently when they heard this news that Jesus was going to return imminently at any moment, they got so excited that they began to murmur among themselves, why are we struggling and working so hard? Let's just wait. <laughs> you know? They, they thought, and, and Paul must have gotten wind of, by, of, by that, because in 1 Thessalonians, in the letter, the first letter to the Thessalonians, he even said this. Let me read it to you if I can find it. He said, uh, 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 this is four, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. Well, when did he tell them? Back when he was first with them. He not only told them, but in the second letter, uh, which we'll read in just a moment, he said, we were an example of that. When we were among you, we worked really hard. So that you would see that you shouldn't be idle. So obviously that was a problem from the very, very, the very get-go in Thessalonica. And, uh, and so that persistent problem also continues here. Let me read uh, the 6th verse through the 15th verse of the 3rd chapter of 2 Corinthians. Not to mention Thessalonians. <laughs> You can read Corinthians at home. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dan. We keep our twins around for a purpose. Here we go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teachings you received from us. Again, that reference. We already taught you this. Why are we having to say it again? <laughs> he said, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. For we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. I love that play on words. <laughs> Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and to earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they might feel ashamed. <coughs> Yet, do not regard them as the an enemy, as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Please don't misunderstand verse 10. I have heard a good many uh, people quote verse 10, and verse 10 is the one, the one who is unwilling to work shall not, shall not eat. I've heard that as an excuse to not do any work among the poor and the needy. Haven't you heard it misused that way? You know what? That certainly is not the context in which it's used here. And it would go against uh, uh, thousands of verses of scripture that tell us to help the poor and the needy. There are many, many hundreds, thousands of verses in the Old and the New Testaments that tell us that when we are to help the poor and the needy. That's not what that verse is about. It's about people within the church who are all of a sudden sitting around waiting for the return of Christ and doing nothing. And when Christ hadn't returned yet, what are they doing? They're getting into other people's business. They're being busybodies. They're being gossips. They're disrupting the nature of the body of Christ. And Paul is saying, no. You misunderstand. God has given us the work of our hands in order that we can use it to be productive both for ourselves and for the common good of the whole body. 
But that's an important thing. Um, this is, you see, this is what honors God. If He's given us the abilities and the gifts that we have, what honors God is that we use them to His glory. And I guess the takeaway that I would give for you today is, um, it, it sounds a little gimmicky, but it, it's really not. I think it's a wonderful truth. A little cliche, but you know cliches are usually truth. And that is, uh, here's, here's the saying, what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are, the, the, the raw material, the raw talents and abilities that we have, those are God-given. Those are the gifts to us. But what we do with them, how we hone them, how we develop them, and how we use them, those are our gifts to Him, to His great glory and honor. And I think that's a good thing to remember on Labor Day. I, I know that many of you are, are working folk and work in a variety of different fields. And I honor you today and I thank you. I'm sure some of you are retired folk like me. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I honor what you have done and what you continue to do in your retirement. I know that uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that I did that I loved was volunteer at the hospital. I can't do that now because of, I'm just too susceptible to, uh, to diseases. I visited every room of every patient and uh, just loved it. I loved it, but I was catching stuff, and that was not good. And there's so many volunteer, uh, so many volunteer opportunities over there where you don't get anywhere near that sort of thing, so don't let that throw you off. Those of you who are retired, if you haven't found something to give your life to, uh, that's a way to honor God too with the gifts and abilities and skills that you have. So what you are is God's gift to you. What you do, what you, how you use it is your gift to God. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and honor you and thank you today. We thank you for this Labor Day. We thank you that you are a gracious God who gives to us gifts and abilities and skills. I pray, Father, that we would use those gifts and abilities and skills to the maximum of our ability so that you might be glorified and honored, so that your people might be helped, so that we might, uh, Father, just uh, uh, be for each other, the, the various aspects of your body. And we will give you the praise and glory always. We pray it in Jesus. Amen.